You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach, and it's summer, which some use as a noun and others as a verb. In fact, in the Preppy Handbook, I believe the chapter was entitled Summer as a Verb because people like to summer in Nantucket, people like to summer in Newport, people like to summer in very special, beautiful places along the East Coast. And other places, of course, but you don't hear it as a verb in most parts of the country. But I love the summer, and in some ways, it's my favorite time of the year, because I feel most myself, I feel most connected to something elemental about myself, All it takes is one hydrangea bush, and I'm six years old again walking around the garden with my grandmother. My grandmother defied expectations and was a very modern woman. My guest this week, Bill Cohen, has also surprised people in his work life. First as a journalist, then he spent 17 years as an investment banker before returning to journalism and book writing. His first book, The Last Tycoons, was about Lazar Frere, an investment bank where he had worked. He is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair and the author of the new book, Four Friends, Promising Lives Cut Short, which is coming out this week. But before our conversation, I wanted to give you my five things that made life better this week. Number one, the time to read. I feel like we all have a little bit more wiggle room, and I use that time to read. And if you are just joining this podcast anew, I've recommended lots of books throughout the year. You might want to read Four Friends, the new book by our guest, William Cohen. Number two, privet hedges, the smell of them. I love it. It's one of those nostalgic scents that takes me back to my childhood. And if you want to know the truth, I also like honeysuckle. Number three, sitting in the shade. I've been scolded not just by my dermatologist, but by many dermatologists. I get it. I'm sitting in the shade now, under a hat with a minimum of SPF 41. How do they determine 41, 45? This is an angry dispute raging among derms. Is it 30? Is it 60? I've seen products that have 100 SPF, and I'm told there's nothing stronger than 60 and 100 is faulty advertising. In any case, the sun is nearby, and I am near the sun. That's what matters. Number four, swimming. I like it. I really like swimming in a pool if necessary, but I like a natural body of water better. I don't really like, you know, hurting my feet on on sharp shells and rocks. I don't like some of the critters that sort of tickle my ankles, but there's something about swimming in the sea and the bay and the sound and the ocean. And I think it's because that's where I swam as a kid. Number five. This is hard-hitting and controversial, but sunglasses. I bought my first pair immediately upon getting rid of my thick prescription glasses and when I began to wear contact lenses. I won't buy the most expensive designer ones because I tend to lose those, and somehow the cheap ones never seem to disappear. Now it's time for William Cohen. It was just a matter of time before Bill Cohen showed up here in the studio begging to come on to this podcast. Uh, and I'm glad today is the day. Today is the perfect day, in fact. In uh, so many ways. In, per- in so many ways. In so many ways. We are going to talk about your new book, and it's called Four Friends, Promising Lives Cut Short. And welcome to the no, podcast. It's great to be here. Anything involving Lisa Burnback is great with me. Oh, listen to that. That's our our next commercial. So um, the th- this book, well, I, I didn't want to go straight to it, but this book is about four people you knew growing up when you prepped at Andover. And the interesting thing to me is that as parents of our generation and younger and uh, the next generation down having kids, People think once their kid gets into the great school, whether it's a nursery school in Manhattan, whether it's Harvard-Westlake in L.A., whether it's New Trier, whatever it is, 
or college, their lives are made. And your book, in many ways, disputes that, doesn't it? Well, it, it certainly dispels that myth. Yes. Uh, in, in a big way. Uh, I think one of the interesting things to that point uh, about Andover at the time that I went, which was in the 1970s, uh, which was the myth was already in the process of being dispelled. You know, um, it used to be, of course, for the first, you know, uh, 150 sort of years of Andover's existence, it's the oldest uh, uh, or, or one of the oldest uh, prep schools uh, in the country, uh, 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 that, you know, it's just basically a feeder to your choice. Pick it. Pick it. Pick it. Harvard, Yale, Princeton, you know, and if you're you know, a bit of a loser, you know, Brown, for instance, okay? Uh, but <coughs> already, uh, yeah, are you yeah. okay over no, there? No, I'm okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Already sort of by the mid-70s, uh, that was that was beginning to change. Uh, and uh, Beginning to change because be- they had opened up their doors to females and a diverse, a more diverse population or because... It wasn't. Why did it stop being a golden ticket? Well, I, I want to caveat and say that uh, it wasn't like a direct line. Like when when George W. Bush went to Andover, even though he was not a very good student and everybody knew him, although he was a popular guy uh, and he was a cheerleader. Right. Uh, but his, bo- you know, his SATs and his boards and his grades were not very good. But of course, he got into Yale. Right. Right. So, uh, like his like his father had his and father his was grandfather. a grandfather. Right. And it, you know, uh, uh, so uh, by the time so that was in the sixties. By by the seventies, I think, you know, we still had uh, our senior class uh, was at about three hundred students, and about one hundred and fifty did you know collectively get into Harvard, Yale, and, and Princeton. Some of them were dupes. Right. Uh, so there were a lot of people going to those schools mm-hmm. still. Uh, but it was clear uh, that it was not a straight line as it had been. You know, taking it wasn't my, a given. Taking my own experience, for instance, you know, I had to suffer at, at Duke. You know, I could not uh, go uh, get into. I did not get into. Were you Harvard. in the witness protection program? Or I, something? I, I think early on. Yeah. Um, I think I've always been in the witness protection program my <laughs> my whole life. Uh, uh, and uh, I feel safe in this room. By the way, I feel very safe. It's kind uh, of womb like. It's lovely. It? It's, yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that it had already begun to change, and and of course, you know, there's. I, I like to say there's some people in my class at Andover, like the peak of their life. Was, was getting their acceptance letter to Harvard, and right. and I can literally see sort of what's happened to them since then. That it literally may have been the peak, uh, uh, and, and some might have peaked at Andover, and not even and and started their downward trajectory immediately <laughs> afterwards. It, it, it's you know anything's possible. You know, right. some people may have started their downward trajectory right coming out of the womb. Uh, so, but I I felt that the place was uh, uh, very intellectually nurturing, uh, very culturally nurturing, very ecumenical. I mean, uh, I felt, you know, even though there was a time when uh, Jewish kids at Andover were, you know, uh, held in check via quota and not so long before I got there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, women had just been admitted after the merger with Abbott uh, literally a few years before. Uh, uh, I felt that th- that I, I did not feel uh, any kind of uh, uh, anti-Semitism. I did not feel any kind of. Uh, 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 I've just felt completely warmth and embraced, and n- no kind of stereotypical criticism of anybody. Uh, at, you know, at any time, I just thought it was a very nurturing and welcome environment. Uh, I, I don't know what it's like now. Uh, it wasn't that d- all that diverse uh, back then. It was mostly white men and women, uh, but there were uh, people, certainly people of color, and I felt that it was all very supportive of mm-hmm. whatever it is you wanted uh, to do and what you were about. In fact, quirkiness is I, uh, an idea I sort of get into in the book a little bit. Uh, uh, quirk- quirkiness was encouraged. Uh, uh, challenging authority was absolutely encouraged. 
but you were always surrounded by uh, the, the 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 adults. So you had to learn how to interact with the adults, and you had to learn. And I think learning how to interact with adults at a place like Andover on a constant basis sort of set you up very well to interact with adults out in the work place if you were at Goldman Sachs or at at McKinsey or whatever you know you from A to B you, you, I mean literally that's I think one of the main reasons people who go to places like that know how to navigate in the real world right. uh, where there are people who seem like they're housemasters and teachers and headmasters at a place like Andover it's like okay you have yeah. to you know you navigate through your housemaster and your teachers and the headmaster and your coaches at Andover you know you have to sort of schmooze them and suck up to them, whatever it is that you needed to do to survive in that environment. And I kind of think that's the way life works, too. And, and uh, you know, I was talking to Joshua Rothman at The New Yorker, and we were talking about our experiences. Uh, at, I think he went to, to uh, you know, Exeter uh, and then Princeton. And so, uh, you know, he was saying that his wife, who he met at Princeton, but she went to public high school, you know, she she spent her whole high school trying to avoid the parents. You know, like, oh, whose house can we go to right after school and never see any parents and do what we want? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and therefore, when she went to McKinsey, believe, you know, for whatever reason, she had a much tougher time navigating that politically. Oh, interesting. Whereas, you know, he and I felt, hey, okay, just more adults that we got to, you know, schmooze and, you know, make feel good and have a sense of humor about and you know that way we'll kind of get rewarded just like we did at Andover in uh, high school yeah. yeah yeah I think also for people who've never been there or never visited uh, a an American institution like Andover Phillips Academy is its official name it looks like a college yes it's huge it's beautiful yes physical it plant is, is extraordinary. The physical plant is extraordinary. And as Bill knows, I spent a summer there. Actually, I spent two summers there uh, in high school. And then when I looked at colleges for the first time, I was a little underwhelmed because few of them at the time had any kind of campus life that looked like or or plant or or landscaping that looked as gorgeous as Andover's. Yeah, and I, I think now it was course, rich with with resources as Andover was. Yes, yes. When I graduated in 1977, Andover was in the middle of its uh, celebrating its bicentennial, which was the next year in '78, uh, and uh, they were in the middle of a 50 million dollar fundraising campaign mm-hmm. uh, for the endowment, uh, which at the time I think was the largest secondary school fundraising campaign and I uh, I convinced them to let me come down to New York for the summer and work on the campaign uh, uh, here with you know the Andover team that was leading the charge of fundraising out of New York at the at this what was then the SNH uh, building on Madison Avenue and 42nd Street uh-huh. uh, and now of course uh, the Andover endowment is like one point uh, two billion. Uh, I think uh, Exeter's is you know one point three billion. Uh, Andover's in the middle of a four hundred million dollar uh, 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 fundraising campaign. I mean, uh, th- they have uh, look. They have uh, incredible resources. Uh, they uh, uh, the physical plan is beautiful. Um, you know, there's you know two hockey rinks, all of these things. But they also have a very well established. Um, it's literally on the seal of the school that was designed and created by Paul Revere and, and Preston Silver by Paul Revere. You know, this idea of youth from every quarter, not for oneself, non sibi. Um, uh, so the uh, scholarships are large. There's sort of a needs blind admissions policy. Uh, you know, th- the key thing I want to convey is that yes, we were privileged, but this is not a book about. Privilege. It's about a book about what happens to people who, even though they seem to have every opportunity in the world, uh, don't always uh, achieve what either they or anybody hoped that they would. And then just that, you know, life comes along, and the reality is that, you know, stuff happens when you least expect it and can obviously ch- change the course of your life or end it. 
before you know it. Did it make you sad working on this book as you had to delve into the lives of four friends of yours or classmates, acquaintances, people you knew pretty well and who, you know, uh, from the starting gate had advantages that same ones that you had. They were so educated even well more, but yes. or more. Yeah. But but certainly, you know, you expect that you'll see them, you'll watch them from afar growing old. Um, look, John Kennedy Jr. is one of your friends, and he was the one I think that you knew the best of these yes. four. Mm -hmm. And He was in my dorm. I was right? his blue key advisor, he, one of his mentors. When he Stearns, arrived. right? Stearns House, that's right. Good on, the, on the lake, on, on the on, pond. On, on the rabbit pond. Right. Yeah. Yes, that was a girl's dorm in the summer. Just no, so there you know, you go. Okay. yeah. Um, so see how ecumenical Andover is. Yes, B boys, boys uh, dorm in the in the winter, girls dorm in the summer. Now uh, I know I knew I met John. Who uh, didn't? Though? Who didn't? Right. Well, and I saw him as everyone did without his shirt on. Thank God. Yeah, thank God for that. Gave yeah. me some hope. But Bill, he he wasn't the best student. He wasn't. He he wore his privilege lightly, I think. Definitely. He, but, I mean, he, he had Secret Service still, right, while he was at Andover? O only until he was 16. Right. And that's why he was in Stern's house, because Stern's was next to the Andover Inn. So the Secret Service was in, like, the basement of the Andover Inn, which was, like, 50 or 100 yards away from our dorm. So the the idea was that if John had any trouble, you know, or whatever, they, but, of course, that was ridiculous. Isn't they that were, a sitcom, though? The son yeah. of the president lives yeah, in the dorm, and they live in the hotel next door. Well, the inn. Well, uh, it's hardly a, a hotel, right? Uh, but uh, you know, and the, uh, originally there was like a buzzer, uh, like a hotline between the Andover Inn and the dorm counselor's uh, apartment. Uh huh. Uh, but it kept malfunctioning, and uh, like their his kids would push the button, and so <laughs> they, they, you know, they just basically. Pulled it out. I mean, uh, uh, but you know, for instance, one one night, uh, I tell this story in the book about how at like ten o'clock at night, John just decides he's hungry. So you know, you're supposed to be in the dorm, like you have uh, you know, like curfews, after, curfews, and you know, you can't be out after ten. But he decides he's hungry, and he wants to go to Lawrence, the next town over, and go to this uh, uh, Mediterranean restaurant. Uh, and get, you know, like pita and pita, hummus. yeah. Well, who doesn't, right? right. Like, like you do. Yeah. Right? So, he, you know, he signals, somehow he calls up the bat phone and he gets the, the, the Secret Service over. And next thing you know, he and I are in the Secret Service car going to Lawrence to, To you get know, your pita. To get the pita and the hummus. And the Mondothra, like you do, right? Uh, I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> right. So uh, it's part of the the hijinks, the youthful hijinks of a, that were encouraged, the right? quirky behavior that right? was encouraged. Right. Now that would have probably been an offense that we would have probably been disciplined for had they known. But I think the statute of limitations is probably run uh, certainly on him. Maybe yeah. not, maybe not on me. And uh, uh, you know, those that was the kind of you know he. But otherwise, he was. Uh, uh, you know, he, he, he wore his pedigree uh, lightly, but in part because he could, right? I mean, everybody knew who he was. He's like the most famous kid in the world. Yeah, and he also was a nice guy. Yes, he I was. I think it needs to be yes. said. He uh, didn't have to be He didn't have no. to be so nice, and he really was. Right, and I would say some other members of the family aren't quite as nice. I would agree. Okay. Uh, he was particularly nice and charming. Hail fellow, well met, regular mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. Made you feel welcome. Didn't you know? Occasionally, you could see that he had to sort of like pull the curtain around and needed his space, which I completely understood because people were always vying for his attention. You could literally see, and I don't know whether you saw this at Brown, but, uh, you know, or. Uh, 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 you could see, or when you knew him, that, that people, as they got asymptotically close to him, would change their whole personality to to try to curry favor with him. Well, he was, if he was in a space, you were magnetically attracted to him. There's well, no question. No question. His his physical being was magnetic. And, and you know, there's that, there's that line in Shawshank Redemption where Red is talking about... Uh, 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 his friend uh, and uh, Dufresne, uh, Andy Dufresne, and he's basically talking about how some 
people's feathers are too bright. Some people's plumage is too bright. And that's sort of the way I felt about John. I mean, it was almost too much wattage yeah. for the rest of us to handle. Uh, you know, he would go to movie openings, you know, and, and there'd be a red carpet and like John Travolta would be there on the red carpet. And John would just show up, you know, to try to go into the opening. <laughs> right. But all the press would immediately go around and, and, and start focusing on him. And John Travolta would be standing on the red carpet by himself. It was literally too much water. He would go out at night and, and you know, he'd come back and, and in his pocket would be, you know, Bruce Springsteen's first wife's phone number, you know, and rumors about, you know, Madonna and, you know, right. you know just, right. uh, you know, sort of... He's yeah, the only... he almost didn't have a chance to be whoever he wanted and was going to be because of the attention, which is distracting. But, but and, and enabling, I mean, uh, it, yes. you, know, you know. But uh, who knows? I mean, you know, he was... And yet he, he turned out incredibly well. He uh, turned out well. He was... Obviously he was, well raised. He by, was definitely uh, well raised by his parents. mom. Yep. But he, um, but but he, uh, you know, was pressured to go into the family business, as they called it. I I read that his uncle Teddy said, "I can get you this seat if you run Ted for Ted Weiss's seat." Ted Weiss's after, seat. After yeah. Ted died. Yeah. But he resisted all that, but but as you'll see in the book, it, uh, at the time of his death, he had actually he was. Going to run for Senate uh, in 2000, uh, uh, but Hillary Clinton had announced she was moving to New York right. and running for Senate, and so he decided, all right, I'm friends with the Clintons. Uh, he, she's obviously older. She was first lady. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna step up at this moment. I'm not gonna and, rain on her parade. And then he decided, well, you know, but what I am gonna do in 2002 is run for governor of New York. He wanted to be governor of New York. He thought of himself more as a chief executive than as a, a you know one of a hundred uh -huh. legislators. And he said, you know, the Kennedys have all been sort of like in the Senate or Congress or president. I want to be a governor, you know. And I guess he thought, well, I've been, you know, head of George Magazine, so <laughs> now I can be governor of New York State. And, and I was uh, a B student at Brown, and uh, you know, barely survived with almost flunked out and had to stay an extra year at Andover. Uh, because he wasn't going to graduate uh, if he hadn't stayed an extra year. But, you know, and he eventually passed the bar at New York uh, after graduating third from New York University. Third time third was the time charm. Third time was the charm. Uh, but I think, you know, there's no question that he would have uh, uh, succeeded in politics. Uh, no question that he would have been governor of New York if he wanted to be. I mean, he had unbelievable wattage, unbelievable. And people were attracted to him. And uh, he, he was very appealing incredibly warm and appealing and and that's what you know makes it it's in part it's heartbreaking such a, a tragedy yeah. literally 20 years ago yeah it's hard to believe that was 20 years ago literally you know july 16th oh my. 1999 um the other three friends that you write about um first of all were they all friends of one another i know they you all knew one another yeah, I mean, I was the one. You I mean, were the connector here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think uh, the other three knew Jack Berman, who was in my brother's class. Right. And I knew him because of the Jewish Student Union kind of thing. The, 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 oh, there the, was such a thing? Well, he, Jack started it, and there were like, you know, 20 of us Jewish kids on campus. And, and it wasn't necessarily a religious thing. It was just like an excuse to, uh, you know, get, you know a get, bagel. get together and then have a bagel breakfast kind of thing. Make a little money, of course, right? <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so that's how I got to know know Jack. I mean, literally, there had been quotas, you know, a decade before. Right. Uh, there really weren't very many Jewish kids at, at Andover at that time, uh, and so we'd have these Friday night uh, services uh, in what was called the Kemper Chapel, which, uh, you know, the 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 Cochrane chapel uh was above was you know and that was like this waspy thing right and, and then you know i don't know all the denominations that well and then and then the kemper chapel down below in the basement was a catholic uh space right so for that's where we had our uh sabbath our, our friday night services you know the six of us or whatever and we'd have to take the brass crucifix off the wall and put it down on a chair 
gently. Gently, of course, uh, and then replace it uh-huh. uh, when we were when we were done. So we, we wow. didn't we didn't have we didn't have our a own. DIY. Yeah, we really had a, a DIY di- shul. A DIY shul and a chance to drink some Moga David <laughs> wine on Friday night uh, uh-huh. without you know uh, uh, being thrown out of, the, of school, uh, and so that's how I got to to know Jack. Uh, 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 Harry Bull and Will Daniel uh, and John uh, and me, we, we did all know each other. I mean, everybody knew John because right, he was John. he was John. Uh, but, you know, Will Daniel was the uh, grandson of, of, of Harry Truman. Right. Uh, his father was Clifton Cl- Daniel, Daniel, the managing editor of the New York Times. Right. Uh, his wife, Robert Margaret Truman. Uh, Daniel, uh, Harry Bull came from, uh, 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 you know, a very... Uh, uh, a reserved but well-known uh, family, a fairly wealthy family. In the Chicago area owned a paper company for a long time, uh, and he was like the first conservative guy, a person I'd ever met. Conservative political views, right? Uh, and you know, and he was very smart and intellectual about it. Uh, and very good natured about it, but you know he was like in this sea of liberals right. in Massachusetts in the seventies, and he had, had sort of you know he was like you know f- for Reagan and you know you never m- forget that right never yeah never yeah it was rare to meet a Republican in New England in the seventies especially who was you know eighteen oh yeah right yeah right. exactly I mean, you know. So, I mean, you know, d- d- Frank Sargent or, or, you know, Eddie King, the governor of Massachusetts. OK, Eddie right. King would go down to the pier, you know, you know, and have some lobster salad or whatever, clam chowder. But, <laughs> chowder. I mean, yeah. Uh, but to, to see somebody who is your peer. Your peer. Who and is who is conservative. Com- and confidently so. Right. And also charmingly so. Yes. So, yes. So uh, it wasn't offensive in any way. Not that it would necessarily be. What about what about um, the kind of daredevil mentality that we sort of all we you and I are not daredevils. Probably John Kennedy was for our longevity. Yeah, yeah. yeah John I mean, Kennedy, I would say, was no um, question. And I think even more than I even knew in right. the reporting of this book and reporting of that part of it, I I I was came across things that he had done that just blew my mind in terms of the risk, on the risk spectrum. Including his last fateful oh, flight. Course. That was really insane yeah. when you parse it down to no instruments, bad weather, late at night, Having and so on. Having had the cast removed from, from his, his, leg. Leg, his, yeah. his foot where he'd broken his foot over Memorial Day weekend in another crazy contraption he should never yeah. have been in. Yeah. Uh, and you need your feet to fly the plane. I mean... He wasn't trained for instruments. Right. He, he the, his his instructor had said he would go with John that and, night, and he, and he said didn't. no. And John said, you know, we're late because Carolyn was late. You know, because she wasn't going to go on the trip at she, all. She wasn't going. She was convinced to go on the trip. She had to get her manicure and her, uh, you know, her right outfit. You know, all that stuff. So she was late. There was a lot of traffic getting over to New Jersey, and basically, John. Being a nice guy to a fault, said to the to to the instructor, "Look, you got wife and kids. If you take me, you know, you're not going to get home until ten o'clock, eleven o'clock at night. Just, I'll be fine. Don't go." Nice to a fault. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But nevertheless, in the seventies and eighties, life what there were less there were less controls. We didn't have seatbelt laws until the seventies. Or mid seventies, right? So people drove without. I think the, the, the maybe even the early eighties. Uh, I opened the book uh, with a story of a uh, uh, two of my other classmates uh, who got into who weren't among the four, right? To sort of set the scene for what got me onto this crazy book venture. Uh, who had been in their second year at Cornell? They were uh, uh, rooming together. It was the end of the year. Um, they had been out drinking, uh, of course, uh, and then at like one forty-five in the morning, driving uh, one of the guy's fast cars, and and one of the seat belts in the passenger side of the seat uh, car didn't work. But it didn't matter; you didn't have to wear your seat belt right. uh, in nineteen seventy-nine. Uh, and uh, they got into this horrific car accident, and both of them were in comas. Uh, uh, you know, uh, had to be transported up to Syracuse Hospital, 
uh, uh, the driver, Bruce McWilliams, uh, he recovered pretty much fully, although he's, you know, had, like, had to be completely opened up and he's got scars on his body. Uh, uh, the, the other guy, David Buck, uh, again, my friends and classmates uh, from Andover, uh, he... Uh, uh, was never really uh, uh, the same. Uh, you know, had to drop out of Cornell, then came back, couldn't really work. Uh, you know, had been this incredibly happy-go-lucky guy, uh, very smart, very affable, and was never the same again, and then basically drank himself to death. Mm. Uh, you know, 20 years later uh, in Seattle, he died alone in a in an apartment that he had. Oh, I mean, what just a tragic so, so, story. Right. I mean, it's sort of, this is, you know, well, these the things Well, the drinking happen. age was 18. Drinking age was 18. You didn't there have to no wear seatbelts. There were no seatbelts. There were no bags, no air airbags. Bags. I mean, no headrests. There were no headrests. You there know. were no cell phones to call your parents and say, I'm leaving this place and I'm know. going There's here. There's no tracking your... There's no tracking. Yeah, I so. mean, in a way, just being alive was more rough and tumble. And yet we were well beyond caveman status. We didn't have to worry about where our next meal was coming yes, from. Yes, that's uh, true. Uh, but but there was a kind of laissez-faire. Our parents were not on top of us. Well, that's, you know, that's they sent you, being sent to Andover means right. by definition they're not on top of you. I mean, I've been on it, my own since I was 13. Your parents didn't love you, Bill. Well, they, they did, but they saw, you know, Hopefully a better. A I better, don't forget. I grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts. I couldn't uh, forget and, that. And, and um, you know, as interesting a place it is, uh, it's uh, it's it's public uh, and private education system was, you know, uh, left something to be desired. And so that being able to go to Andover, which was forty five minutes away, you know, was opened up a whole new world. So and, and it did. And you could have been a day boy, I guess. Forty five no, minutes, minutes is too, much. too long. There were day students from, from who lived in the town of Andover, but and they were the ones who usually procured alcohol for the boarders. Is that true? Well, there there was at the Andover Inn. There was a pub for students. If you were over eighteen, you could drink. Oh, right. It's crazy. Well, that's the thing. Eighteen year olds were right. happily served. I was not. 18 at, when I was at Andover. Right. Uh, uh, I was the second youngest in my class. Harry Bull uh, yes, was, was the, the youngest. Was the youngest. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, you know, therefore we couldn't couldn't drink legally. Right. Yeah. There was a lot of, uh, we, we used to say, um, you know, there was a cartoon in the uh, potpourri, which is the Andover yearbook, uh, in the yearbook, in the class of 76 or 75, uh, there was just like this guy saying, oh, there's no drug problem at Andover. Uh, we can get anything we want, right? So, so, right. Uh, it was not a, a bit, problem. It was a bit. It was a bit of a free for all back then. They've certainly since then tightened up the rules and regulations considerably, and they had been quite tight in the '60s under Headmaster John Kemper before he died of cancer when he was young, and then Ted Sizer came from the Harvard School of Education, and then before he went to Brown uh, after he left Andover, and he was a very progressive. Yeah. Thinker. He he completely opened the school up. Uh, it's sort of like finally you know, the merger with Abbott took place and people really let their hair down quite literally and metaphorically. John Kemper had been a, a Marine, uh, you know, very much a wet, buttoned up guy, you know, had dress codes and chapel requirements and hair couldn't be a certain length and blah, blah, blah. You couldn't even ride your bicycle on campus. I mean, you know, the, 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 there, although you could might smoke. Lead, with, might lead to impure thoughts, the p- bike? You know, potentially. I or don't know. lead you to He's, PETA. Uh, you know that way you can get to in, Peta and in Lawrence. Lawrence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the place really uh, uh, w- was metamorphizing when when I was there for the better, and I frankly was the beneficiary of that. It was so the seventies were and probably some part of the eighties were great uh, at Andover. Sort of this incredible balance between you know uh, intellectual challenge and rigor and f- freedom to. To express yourself in all these different ways, and like this, getting back to this quirkiness thing again. I think nowadays, of course, you know, helicopter parents much stricter. Everybody's, you know, you can't do X, Y, Z. Right. You know, I used to go as business manager of the Andover paper. I used to go to to, to Harvard Square once a week to the Crimson to print the paper, and it was just like a bonanza every week yeah. for me. Yeah. I mean, it's like wow. I'm it probably offered you reefer. You know. 
I don't go there. Okay, I you mean, don't have to answer I, that. I have children. I can't talk about that. But and it's not legal in the state that we're in. So no. Um, so you know, the the place was changing. Uh, it was great, but you know, I lost touch with these four guys. You know, is is what is happens. Do you? What is your relationship to your Andover classmates now, and to the school? In fact, now that this book is coming out. Well, uh, we'll are see. Are you an official? Are you? Uh, have you been blessed by, by the institution it's, of Phillips it's, it's Academy? Fun, it's, it's funny that you, uh, you ask that. I mean, we'll have to a see. So far, so good. I think it's very. Uh, so you know, that's funny. If I just may digress for a minute, you know, my, my previous books, uh, one about Lazard, right, uh, where you of, had worked, where I had worked, but never one thought about I, Duke, where you had gone had, to school right. under the witness protection program. <laughs> that's correct. Uh, uh, one about Bear Stearns in the class, right. which I'd competed against, and one about right. Goldman Sachs, which I'd also competed against. So basically, those four books were, uh, you know, real pull the curtain back, yes, kind of books. Uh, he, here's what really happened. Here's the way life really was, and I think it's safe to say. Uh, that none of those four institutions, to the extent that they still exist, Bear Stearns no longer no exists. No longer, right. Uh, so now by transitive property, J.P. Morgan uh, doesn't like me where I used to work. So none of those four institutions really uh, uh, were happy that I wrote this no book. No thank and, and, yous, yeah. Yeah, no. No, no well, you know, come in and give us your insights about our, our organization. Right. You know, come, come to Duke and tell us what we should have done during the lacrosse <laughs> scandal. lacrosse scandal, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this is a very different. Uh, I, I I feel like I want to make sure people, uh, you know, understand that this isn't sort of pulling the curtain back on Andover. This is this is a very special place. Uh, we had a great experience there. Uh, I met these people there, and then we went out into our lives. And this is a time before social media. There was no Facebook. There's no right. Instagram. There's no keeping in touch. There were no cell phones. If you didn't know somebody's. Uh, uh, home phone number. <laughs> well, home. Forget home phone. If you didn't you know the the pay phone in their dorm, how would you keep in touch with them? And you know, basically, guys didn't write guys oh, right. letters. Oh, right. So, you were a guy, right? right. So, right. You had to know the dorm phone. You had to know the. And who knew that? And I who mean, knew that? Who knew that? So, you know, uh, the, the truth is, you, you lost touch. And then I would run into John in New York because you know, literally on the street, and right? We would pick up right where we left off, but. You know, Jack, you moved to San Francisco. I didn't right. know him. Uh, uh, I run into Will Daniel. I, I tell in the book the story of how I ran into Will Daniel a few years before he died uh, uh, in Riverside Park when I was running. Uh, and he was sitting on a park bench by himself at like 3 in the afternoon. Couldn't believe it. Yeah. But, but it said so much about Will. Once you read this part of the book about Will, you'll see that this was like perfect Will. Uh, and Harry Bull, I would see at the reunions because uh, he he was in New York, but then he moved back to Chicago. Uh, you know, people start their lives, people do their things, they and move on. And you know, you have a bond. Uh, it's interesting because I went to a private day school, and I am a kind of inveterate reunion goer because I have such fond feelings for my classmates. It was a much smaller class. There were 95 in my whole grade. Um, but I do go to reunions, and I do use, I have used Facebook, which is a, a platform I, I detest, to I stay in touch. I detest it so much that I don't even use it. Well, you have more uh, integrity than I do. I don't know what it is. I'm good but, at keeping a secret, but no, I apparently. am definitely not so good with staying away from Facebook because I have deliberately looked for people, and it took about till last year till my class had a real place to go on Facebook. But there's a warmth and a... And uh, look, there are people who remember you when you were little. They remember your parents. They remember what it was like. Uh, they, they they remember that time that the teacher yelled at you. They, You have a shortcut. Do you go back to reunions? Do you, is that yeah, meaningful I mean, I, to you? I, yeah, I mean, Andover is very meaningful to me. I was the class secretary for a while, you know, who, who helped That's a big deal. raise money. I was the class scribe. I wrote the notes the in, the, in the alumni magazine. magazine. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I would have been uh, happy, sort of bittersweet, uh, if my kids had gone there. 
Teddy uh, applied and got in, and then of course Deb had, Deb had made clear to me from the outset of this they were now they going were never to going to, to boarding school. Uh, so you know, you know, fifteen years later, when it was an opportunity, you know, I thought I'd revisit it. Mm-hmm. You know, her 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 decree. Yes, uh, and uh, so she allowed uh, Teddy to apply. So we went through the process, and he got in. Uh, but of course, she nixed. Uh, going, which you know, frankly, it's fine because I had them around and I and I love them to pieces. So right, you know, it worked out just fine. Uh, but you know, that's the way I felt. I felt Andover was, uh, you know, just a very special place because uh, of the friends and the teachers and the learning and the ability, you know, the freedom to explore and to have a little mischief, uh, but quirk. not too much, and be quirky. You know, uh, you know. Quirkiness was celebrated and rewarded, and you know people like Peter Sellers was there, the great opera. theater opera impresario. Right. He was in the class. I mean, talk about a quirky. Yeah, I mean, right. And James Spader, you know, I mean, it, I mean, there were just lots and lots of people like that. It was incredibly. Rare. I thank my parents all the time for letting me go there. Yeah, I mean, it yeah. was it was great. It is great, and you know what else? Education is the answer. Maybe not many people get to go to an Andover or an Exeter, but but the idea of education as a launching pad is so important and very important to me, and it makes all the difference in a person's life. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more, and I think, you know, Andover with a billion three endowment is a place that can, you know, uh, uh, have people who can't afford otherwise to go there to go there. Right. So anybody who's sort of listening to this podcast and thinking, well, it's who, out of my league. It's out of my league. Or, or who are these privileged that, people yeah. talking about this place that's privileged and what? Is, how does it relate to me? And the fact is that you know anybody can go there uh, uh, if they have the desire to go there and the ambition. To, to, That's to, a good to point. Succeed and the same goes for private colleges. By the way, of course, when you think you have to go to a state school because that's what you can afford, it it pays yeah, to the look times into. They are changing. Yes, yes, uh, and public school could end up being more expensive than a private college because again, they don't have the endowment. And, and and not that there's you know you can get the great thing is you can get a, a, a great education in a lot of different places. Absolutely. Uh, you know Andover at least at that time was incredibly special and unique and uh, you know I'm glad that I went there and glad that I had that experience. Uh, probably the best educational experience I had in my life and you know I met these people and you know I felt that 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 you know not necessarily no i mean i mean john was a good friend the others were not like my best friends uh but i felt that we had all shared something special and their deaths sort of really rocked me and shocked me and i just like i wanted to know what happened uh you know when bear stearns Died, and I wanted to know what happened, uh, you know, in the bathroom on Buchanan Boulevard in, in in Durham, North Carolina, in March of 2006. I wanted to know what happened to mm-hmm. my friends, mm-hmm. how how they how they got to Andover in the first place, which is an amazing story in a lot of cases. What they did afterwards, you know, when I was sort of we were out of each other's lives, and then you know how their lives developed and moved along, and then ha- how they met with this tragic end in yeah. each case. Yeah. I really yeah. wanted to know. And so I guess one of the beauties of being an investigative reporter is you can investigate. You can do this kind mm-hmm. of thing. The book is called Four Friends, Promising Lives Cut Short. Bill Cohen, thank you so much for coming in. And let's talk about your five things that make your life better, if you don't mind. Uh, how would how would you like that we talk about these things? I think I'll just say number one, and you'll say... Your my family, family right. and then you can say what just a, a well, morsel 
well, about I mean, how wonderful your family well, is. Well, I mean, the, my family is everything to me. We're very close. Uh, we've always been very close, probably because they, my boys didn't go to Andover. That's so right. They were around during high school, and you I got, got to, to know them. And well, I got to watch as you know they would uh, misbehave on the weekend when they weren't supposed to, that kind of thing, and thinking they were getting away with it, and we didn't know, but of course we did. Right. Uh, and so you planted that chip in their soul, the yeah, soles of their feet. It, it was in the rug ah. as they were walking. So yeah. when the throw up hit the sensor, <laughs> th- then we could tell something had happened. Uh, you know, I, you know, I happily have, married have, and have these great, uh, great, great boys. Right. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I am blessed with, uh, you know, having, being able to live in New York. I have a uh, no, that's number two. That's now number, number two. two. I'm not allowed to move on to number two yet. Well, I have to say, number two. Oh, I see. Number two is your many homes. Well, let's not get carried away well, here. More uh, than two. Okay. True. True. Um, you know, uh, I have a place here in New York, which is great. You know, I, I confess. You know, before I was a writer. In between my first stint as a writer when I uh, when I was in my twenties, and my second stint as a writer for the last fifteen years, I was a, a, a dreaded Wall Street investment banker. Yeah, so yes. uh, I was able to get overpaid year after year after year uh, for, for for my limited skill set, and uh, then was able to. You were smart and, about it, smart. yes. So I have an apartment, and then we have a farm upstate, which is gorgeous, and then. You know, a little home in Nantucket that's... Which is also gorgeous. Gorgeous, as long as it doesn't that's go into rain. the ocean. Right. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's nice to be in those places, and I feel blessed to be oh. able to, to do that. And how much time do you spend in Nantucket? I know the answer to this already. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically as much time during the summer as I can. Right. Which is, you know, I think one of the great things about being a writer yes. is, you, you know, with an internet connection, you can be anywhere. And do anything. Uh, and so that works. Excellent. Number three, well, traveling, number three, and, traveling adventure. and adventure. You know, uh, I love to travel and I love adventure. Uh, you know, I, uh, one of the most memorable experiences in my life, uh, without the risk that John Kennedy liked to take, was I spent three weeks trekking to uh, the Mount Everest Base Camp. You did? In Nepal. When? Yes. Back a few years ago, uh, wow! It was it was it was an incredible physical experience. It was an incredible emotional experience. It was an incredible spiritual experience because you know, not only are you up above the tree line, uh, but you know there's th- 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 there's a path, uh, uh, but there's no you know there's no cars, there's no bicycles, there are yaks, there are people you know walking along this sort of Appian Way that goes to the Mount Everest base camp. You know, over this incredibly beautiful Himalayan terrain, and you know, there's, there's like tea houses and things uh, along, and and and, and uh, Buddhist temples and all sorts of uh, things that are kind of some slight bits of commerce that are set up to, uh, you know, cater to the people going uh, back and forth from Everest. But uh, it was incredibly uh, spiritual and moving, and. Um, and, and and like half of the people that I went with, uh, uh, who I didn't know even, uh, had to drop out because the, you know the altitude. The altitude. And they got sick, and then you know. So to be one of the ones that made it uh, uh, to the base camp, and then getting there and seeing how crazy it was there. Well, I've seen pictures. Seen we pictures all have. Of, it's bumper to bumper. Right, and, and it's Sherpa bumper to bumper at the top. At it's the even top. crazier down at the base camp. But what you quickly realize is. You know, unless you're, I think, kind of certifiably nuts, but that's okay. Uh, uh, you don't want to go any further. You know, it's clear that it was clear to me, and I love mountain hiking, and I've hiked uh, Mount Whitney twice, which is the highest peak in, in the in continental the country, continental right? United States in California. Uh, and I, you know, I've been on Outward Bound twice and Knowles. Uh, so I like that kind of thing. But I got to you know eighteen thousand feet at the Mount Everest Base Camp and I you know there were there were the Kumba Ice Falls were right there and I think you know that's it I don't need you know I've done it I'm happy I'm happy I'm happy to turn around and go back to Lukla Airport and see if I can get the heck out of here <laughs> wow had no idea yeah. number four 
Yeah, old friends, new friends, interesting people. I mean, you know, it isn't you know what's more important in life than than that. I mean, connecting. Just, just well, you know, some people because you know you lose track of people, but I think one of the great things about uh, you know Andover and and Duke and you know, Columbia, uh, various two Columbia graduate schools, uh, journalism and business is you you know you get to know a lot of people, and even on Wall Street where most people were not very good to one another. I still have friends from there. And of course, you know, being a journalist and a writer, you know, you meet all sorts of interesting people. And I, you know, they're kind of like fake friends, but, you know, because, uh, you know, as we talked about before, you know, my four books about, you know, those yes. are, I didn't make a whole lot of friends writing right. those books, but right. that's okay. I mean, at least, you know, my calls get returned. People will talk to me and it's, there's always sort of interesting things going And on. I should say, you write for The Hive at Vanity Fair, and you are... And also, I'm a special correspondent an, at, a, the, at the magazine, uh, too. And have ah, been, that's have right. have been for, since 2008. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. You you survived the junta, the uh, regime change. Let's just change. say I went from one era to another, very happily. Excellent. And, and, uh, you're one of my few friends who has, and I think that's great. And you um, do have your finger on the pulse. Uh, number five, which well, is a very just, good just, segue yeah, here. Just, you know, my, my work being able, I honestly feel blessed to be able to do what I do. Uh, and to, It's fun, isn't and, it? Yeah, well, I mean. It's hard, but it's, it's a lot. It's, it's very hard. I mean, I'm working on my new book, which is about the rise and fall of GE, and it literally is bringing me back to, to like trying to, climb to Mount Everest. I mean, it's it's very difficult work. Nobody can do it for you, as you know. Um, you know, it's you have to be totally self-motivated. Uh, and writing is very solitary and very hard. But as I learned in journalism school from the great Professor Mel Mencher, you can't write writing. You can only write reporting. So if you haven't done the reporting, don't even start to you know, put words onto the page. You know, I I say that to myself every day. You can't write writing. You can't write writing. Exactly. Uh, that's the best advice I've, among the best advice I ever got, along with my father telling me I should go to business school. Those are the <laughs> two best pieces of advice I've gotten in my, my life. My father's big advice to me was always have a valid passport, which Smart. is also very good advice. Very good advice. Yeah, especially these days. Exactly. Given, you know, certain leadership aspects of our country. So I want to thank you. Thank I you. want to remind our listeners that they can read all about you on my website at lisabernbach.com. The book, again, is Four Friends, Promising Lives Cut Short. And uh, it's published by... Flatiron Books. Flatiron Books. I'm sorry that I paused there. Of course I knew that. And you have a website. It's William Cohen with an A dot com. Exactly. Thank you. You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with Lisa Birnbach. That's me. My guest this week has been William Cohn. Cohen, author of the soon to be published Four Friends Promising Lives Cut Short published by Flatiron Books. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and YouTube, or wherever else you might find a podcast. My God, that seems to be enough. My blog is at lisabernbach.com, where you'll find links and photos about all the things we spoke about here today. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Jimmy Regan. My team is Spressa Rucci, Michael Port, and Sam Haft. Until next week, stay cool and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Bernbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers. <laughs>